Hey everyone, thank you for joining me today for this series on formal verification of arbiters. My name is Vinish and I'll be guiding you through this topic. Before we begin, I'd like to thank all my viewers and my network for the valuable feedback on my previous videos. I'm really happy to see that my videos have helped a lot of people in getting started with formal or refreshing their concepts in formal. In the future sessions, I'll try to dive deeper into more formal verification techniques demystify complex concepts with practical examples, help you ace those interviews and land your dream job in formal verification. If you find any of this interesting, please consider subscribing to my channel, Formal Intelligence. What are arbiters? Arbiters play a crucial role in modern digital designs. They resolve conflicts when multiple devices or components request access to a shared resource, such as a memory bus or a network interface. Despite their ubiquity, verifying arbiters can be challenging, especially when relying solely on simulation-based methods. So why do we not use simulation-based method or why shouldn't we use only simulation-based method for verifying an arbiter? One, time. Simulating arbiters involves running extensive test benches, which can take significant amount of time. And as the designs grow in complexity, simulation-based verification can become less efficient. Incomplete coverage. Simulation may cover some of the cases or most of the cases, but it can always miss a corner case, which can eventually lead into critical bug. That's what brings us to formal verification. Formal verification is a mathematical approach to proving the correctness of digital designs. Unlike simulation, it analyzes the design exhaustively, considering all possible input combinations. There are certain key benefits for formal verification. One is completeness. Formal methods explore all possible states, ensuring comprehensive coverage. Bug detection. Formal tools can identify subtle corner case, bug, corner case bugs and potential race conditions. And the third is efficiency factor, where formal verification can be seamlessly clubbed with simulation to reduce overall verification time in a project. Now, let's talk about the key uh, point key discussion uh, for today that is arbiters. So there are different types of arbiters. One is fixed priority, second is round robin and so on. So let's talk about round robin arbiters in today's session. We have already covered fixed priority arbiters in a video before this. In fixed priority, the priority of arbitration is fixed. Let's say there are eight requesters and the priority is starting from 0 to 7, meaning 0th requester will always get the highest priority. <clears throat> if 0th in clock 0, requester 0 and requester 1 are requesting, then requester 0 will get a grant. And in clock 1, <clears throat> in the next clock, if requester 0 and requester 1 are again requesting, requester 0 would again get a grant. Whereas in round robin arbiters, in the second case, requester 1 would get a grant. This is because the arbitration priority in even though originally out of reset it was 0 to 7 meaning 0 is having the highest priority and 7 having the lowest in order in the second clock cycle since request 0 already got a grant the priority shifted to 1 so it's from 1 2 3 7 and then 0 So the round robin arbiter we are going to discuss has, uh, I'm a, in, in that I'm assuming the following cases, following conditions rather. So there is no clock cycle delay from request to a grant. And then there is only one grant at a time and request stays is asserted until it is granted. There are uh, two approaches that we are going to use for verification of round robin arbiter today. One with the use of symbolic variables and second obviously without the use of symbolic variables. If you're hearing the term symbolic variables for the very first time, it's a good time to go back and look at the look at my previous video on symbolic variables. But if you don't want to do that, sim the concept of symbolic variable is uh, like this. It's a free running signal that you can introduce in your formal bench. You can you usually keep it stable so that it can pick one out of the many possible values for a particular uh, range of values allowed in the design. We'll come to that more in detail later. So the 
uh, sum total of all the assumptions and checks we are going to discuss is this. Request should remain high until granted. Request should be deasserted eventually. Every request should be deasserted eventually. These are assumptions and the checks. One grant at a time. No grant with the request. And all requests should be granted eventually. It's a liveness property. Again, liveness and safety are two different type of formal properties in formal. Uh, good idea to go back and read about them. And then the final property, everybody gets a request. Everybody gets a chance for a grant. Uh, if I go back to the previous slide, so this is uh, the the keywords, the tag C1, C2 to C7 are for checks, which we are going to discuss in the next uh, slide onwards. And A1 and A2 are assumptions. Let's discuss the two assumptions here. Request should be deasserted eventually. So within a generate loop, which is uh, ranging from zero to number of requests, not log two, it's a mistake. Um, it says for every request I, it should eventually go to negation of request I. It should be deasserted. Second, A2, request should remain high until granted. Request I implies request I until grant I. Again, for every I. We could use delayed versions of signals and get rid of the keyword until. So wherever possible, um, it's a good idea to keep uh, very simple uh, expressions. Checks. So uh, again, we are going to use uh, generate loops for writing these checks, uh, at least the checks C2 and C3. So no grant without a request. For every every I requester I, if the request is zero, shouldn't be a grant. And C3, all requests should be granted eventually. Request I implies is eventually grant I. And the first check C1 doesn't require a generate loop. It simply says at any point in time, there should be only one grand at the max one grand. There can be zero grands as well. Okay. Now, more about symbolic variables. When we use symbolic variables, uh, in this case, we are going to pick two symbolic variables out of the eight requesters which we discussed we're going to pick randomly two of them uh, let's say zero and one and then assign it to symbolic request one and symbolic request two respectively we don't want it to toggle between like zero and one or two or keep changing the values so in for that we're going to add an additional assumption saying that the symbolic variable should be stable from the first cycle onwards second cycle onwards now um, there should be another assumption saying that these are these are different. It shouldn't be equal. This is not which is not shown here. It's a good idea to add that. The first check: no grant without a request. There is no generate loop with when we are using symbolic variable. That's one of the key things. We just replaced all the n uh, eight properties with a single one by the use of symbolic variables. It says for a picked symbolic variable symbolic request one, there shouldn't be a grant. Since the symbol request can take any value from zero to seven, the single property is equivalent to those eight properties within the generate loop. And the request, another check is uh, this, all requests should be granted eventually. Again, just using symbol request and not using generate variable. So C6 and C7, these are the two final checks. Uh, kind of the key checks uh, for random uh, round robin arbiter. So this says if there was a, there is a request for from request one, uh, just assuming symbol request one is assuming the value of request for one and symbol request two is picking the value of two for uh, reason as an explanation. So requested one is requesting and in the previous cycle there was a grant for request two. Then in the current cycle there shouldn't be a grant for request two. So we kind of uh, making sure that request one is going to get a grant, or at least uh, request two is not going to block block the grants for request one or any other requester. This can be written in a different way as well, uh, or <clears throat> another way to express this is as follows. So there is a modeling logic here for this. So um, we are introducing another. Uh, actually, I'm referring to this video from Cadence, which is publicly available in YouTube. Um, 
So there's an internal signal which says request two should be granted. It's a modified version of the code from this video. Request two should be granted. Uh, says it's uh, getting reset out of reset, uh, set to zero out of reset. And when the request two is actually getting a grant, it is again it should it's reset to zero. It's saying that request two shouldn't be granted in the next cycle. Now, if there is a request one, a request from the source one, and then there is a grant for the same requester, whereas in the same cycle our requester two is requesting, then in the next cycle request two should be granted. Actually, this is one tick B one, my bad. So it says I if the check is as follows: if there is a grant for requester one, then request 2 should be granted the signal should be 0 something to think about with this video we have covered the formal verification of fixed priority and round robin arbiters if you found this video don't forget to hit the subscribe button and share it with your colleagues